Hello and welcome to Shredder Zoo. I'm here at the Avery to look at some fascinating creatures, the pterosaurs. Ark Survival Evolved has four pterosaur species, the Dimorphodon, the Pteranodon, the Tabahara and the Quetzalcoatlus. Here at the zoo I've already given a talk on the Dimorphodon, feel free to go back and watch that one. So today I thought I'd explain what makes a pterosaur and we can take a closer look at the three remaining species. Pterosaurs were the largest flying animals to ever have existed, with even the largest birds not coming close to the size of the largest pterosaurs. It must be mentioned that pterosaurs are not the ancestors of birds, those are the feathered dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, nor did they evolve from dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are the earliest known vertebrates to master the air by flying, and until their evolution the only other animals in the air were flying insects. The first pterosaur known to science was Pterodactylus, described by the Italian naturalist Cosimo Alessandro in 1784. But back then, no one really knew what it was. Many scientists inferred that it was more like a bat, or something between a bat and a bird. Some even put forward the suggestion that it was actually a marine creature, and suggested that the wings were actually flippers. Over the following years, more fossils were being discovered, and many new species were being named. However, because not much was known about these creatures, many, if not most of these, were not new species at all. For example, it was not known that pterodactylus individuals varied considerably with age, with the result that pterodactylus juveniles and subadults were incorrectly named as different species. It would not be until the closing years of the 20th century that the mass study between different specimens combined with the new knowledge of changing morphology between individuals of different ages of the same species, the many of the classic pterosaur genera could be cleaned up, with the exhaustive lists of unnecessary species names got reduced to the actual representative types. Pterosaurs had hollow bones filled with air which made them exceptionally lightweight. These bones were also capable of maintaining rigid strength ensuring that the wings kept their shape. The downside of this for science is that the bones were not very resilient to crushing forces such as the buildup of sediment and make studying their fossils a challenge. When scientists first started studying pterosaurs, they thought them only capable of gliding, relying on thermal updrafts to keep them in the air. The thought that they could flap their wings was dismissed. This was because, like all reptiles today, pterosaurs were thought to be cold-blooded, and active wing flapping would require a much higher energy expenditure than is possible with a cold-blooded body. This thinking is now outdated. Certainly smaller pterosaurs did flap their wings. Even larger species like Pteranodon would be capable of flapping its wings. Well, let's take a closer look at the Pteranodon. The Pteranodon was named by Charles Othaniel Marsh in 1876 and was the first toothless pterosaur to be discovered, and its name means toothless wing. Something that isn't represented here in Ark is the fact that there was a huge difference in size between the males and the females. Males had a wingspan of around 5.6 metres, with the largest approaching 6.25 metres, whereas females were much smaller with a wingspan of around 3.5 metres. Fossil remains have been found in North America and date from the Late Cretaceous period. Many more female specimens have been found than male ones, and this indicates that the male would mate with many females across his territory and not just form a single mating pair. Pteranodon is thought to have hunted for fish across the open ocean and as such spent extended periods away from land. Much like a modern albatross, dynamic soaring may have helped it reduce the amount of energy it had to use. By flying low into a trough between two sets of waves, a pteranodon could turn into the oncoming wind as it rises over the crest of a wave. Because the air has to rise over the wave, it gets packed together, increasing its pressure. This increased pressure would cause the pteranodon to rise up into the air without any effort on its part. Once up, the pteranodon could then change direction and dive again, this time with the wind behind it, increasing its speed so that the next time it pulls the manoeuvre, the effect is even greater. Many remains of fish scales and bones have been found preserved in the fossils of the Pteranodon, however the feeding strategy is a little more uncertain. The common view is that the Pteranodon scooped fish up out of the water as it's skimming along the surface, but other suggestions are that it may have landed on the water and snatched fish up while it was floating on the surface, or possibly it may have dived into the water from a height, much like how modern gannets feed. This could be a possibility as the head and shoulders of the Pteranodon have a robust construction similar to modern diving birds. One distinctive feature of the Pteranodon is its head crest, which was probably used for display. 
But if we're going to talk about head crests, we should probably move on to another pterosaur, the Topahara. One thing that should be mentioned is that in Ark Survival Evolved, the Topahara isn't actually a Topahara. The model it used is, is actually based on a, a Tubendactylus imperator. Both the Topahara and the Tubendactylus live around the same time in the early Cretaceous period, around 112 million years ago, and both can be found in Brazil. The Topahara had a wingspan of around 3.5 metres, but the Tupendactylus is much larger, with a wingspan of 5 metres. It was once thought that the Topahara was a juvenile form of the Tupendactylus, which was originally named the, the Topahara Imperator, but further studies found that the larger pterosaur had significant differences from the Topahara, and in 2006 was reclassified and named Tupendactylus. The head crest is composed partly of bone and partly of soft tissue. It would have been used for display and probably brightly coloured. It has been suggested that it may have played an aerodynamic role, however this seems unlikely. By the time of the Cretaceous, when the Topahara and the Tupendactylus lived, the pterosaurs had developed a multitude of different crests of various shapes and sizes. Had the reason for the crest been aerodynamic, it would have been likely that the pterosaurs would have developed only one or two different kinds to suit different lifestyles. So to end our talk, let's take a look at the last of our pterosaurs here at the zoo, the Quetzalcoatlus. The largest flying animal ever to have existed, it had a wingspan of around 11 metres. Estimates of its mass are extremely problematic because no existing species share a similar size or body plan, and in consequence, published results vary widely. While some studies have historically found extremely low weight estimates of Quetzalcoatlus, as low as 70 kilograms, that's around 150 pounds, for a 10 meter individual, a majority of estimates published since the 2000s have been higher, around 200 to 250 kilograms, that's around 440 to 550 pounds. The Quetzalcoatlus dates from the late Cretaceous, around 68 million years ago, and its remains were found in Texas in 1971 by Douglas A. Lawson. The skull material shows that it had a very sharp and pointed beak that it wasn't fully able to close. It seems unlikely that the Quetzalcoatlus would have fed in the same manner as the Pteranodon, plucking fish out of the water as it skimmed along the surface. It was just too big and this would use up too much energy. Most Quetzal remains are found in land deposits far from seas or other large bodies of water required for skimming. Additionally, the beak, jaw and neck anatomy are unlike those of any known skimming animal. Rather, they were more likely terrestrial stalkers, similar to modern storks, and probably hunted small vertebrates on land or in small streams. Though Quetzalcoatlus, like other pterosaurs, was a quadruped when on the ground, Quetzalcoatlus had fore and hind limb proportions more similar to modern running ungulate mammals like the giraffe than to their smaller cousins, implying that they were well suited to a terrestrial lifestyle. Well, we've covered a lot of information in this video, and I really hope you found it interesting. Any comments or questions, please leave them down below, and thank you so much for watching, and I hope you join me next time for more zoo adventures. Thank you, and goodbye.